All right, Matt, too good. Welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. I've been really, really excited to have you on the show um, after I had discovered Royal Coffee um, about uh, a year ago. Um, if anybody knows how much I like my whiskey, I think I like my coffee, my morning coffee even better. And uh, it's just been, you know, if it wasn't for raw coffee, I don't think I would have upped my knowledge on everything from the beans to the machinery um, to, to just the whole like world of coffee. And, and so thank you for like starting raw coffee with your, with your partner. And thanks for coming to the show. Really appreciate uh, it. Thank you for having me. It, it, look, I'm going to say one thing that's going to be really controversial right off the bat. People like yourself probably didn't get exposed to us until COVID came along. It's been one of the best things that has ever happened to our business is COVID because we've actually had people taking the time to actually go and spend more energy and trying to find out about it. So there you go. So one thing came that was good out of COVID was that perhaps, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, let me right off the bat ask you, I mean, you guys came from New Zealand in 2007, right, uh, to start the business here? So Kim was here. Kim's been in uh, the Middle East for ooh, nearly 28 years. Mm -hmm. And then she's been in Dubai for a long time. And I came up uh, with my family 2008. Mm -hmm. So Raw started in 2007. And then 2008, I joined Kim. And uh, then it went from there. Yeah. But it was a different world back in 2007, 2008 in this country. I remember. I mean, I, when I first moved here, the, the city was, I mean, even JLT as a location was still being built at the time. And that's just the real estate. Never mind everything else that happened over the last 10 years. So it's just been a crazy, like, last, what was it 13 years, not even 10 years? I actually remember driving around the area we we're in at the moment back. Uh, 2009 and getting lost mm. in here because there was no street lights there was nothing yeah you know and and now look at the city it's incredible it's, it's amazing such a i just hope that like they find a way to recover from what happened because uh well i, th I think i'm quite optimistic that somewhere in the leadership if they manage to build the city out of nothing from the desert all the way to where it is today i'd like to be i'd like to believe that we're going to get recovered from corona and you know get the tourists back and life is back to normal people have jobs again and all that stuff so it should be a matter of time hopefully i'm super proud to be a dubai startup yeah like yeah. dubai is a very very cool city dubai um and the uae is just a wonderful place if you are prepared to be here and be part of dubai right and you know like i think that we'll recover quicker than anybody you know the fact that you know you can walk down the street and get a vaccination you know you can you, know, you can do all this sort of stuff they'll, they'll do everything where they possibly can to get us back to uh trading and doing everything and you know what sometimes a little bit of pain is uh is gain as well so yeah. you know there's been a few businesses that i've seen that that uh, have succeeded and i've seen a lot of businesses that have failed yeah but maybe they should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just part of it, right? Yeah. Uh, I had a venture capitalist on called um, Khalid Talhouni, um, episode five, I think. And he just like right off the bat said, I mean, that's just part of it. Some businesses, it's the way that the, you know, the natural order of this business world is that some companies can survive, others have to restart. And, and, and that's just, it's, it's okay, right? I mean, it's not okay. It's easy for us to say that, but I mean, it's just, it's how it's been and how it's supposed to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know? When I met Kim, to, and, and she won't mind me saying this, uh, the business was basically bankrupt. Yeah. You know, she'd been going for a year, um, you know, put as much money as they had into the business. And, uh, you know, within weeks of looking at the books, I'm just going to her, look, this is just not going to work. Yeah. You know, you don't have enough cash. And, you know, like uh, we're really proud today. The first year that we worked together, we sold 400 kilos of coffee. Wow. Now we roast 400 kilos a day minimum. Wow. Yeah. Good so, for you guys. You know, like, you know, there, there's, there's got to be a business side to everything, mm. and cash is king. And, and, I, and I ran the business before I had the luxury of employing people who are way better at me looking after accounts. Yeah. Um, you know, I ran the business on a, an Excel spreadsheet, which was how much money do we have in the bank? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, and that's probably why, like, during COVID, we survived because we had cash in the bank. I always have a backup. Yeah. You know, you have to, you know, if you're living in a in a place where there's no handouts, right, we don't pay tax, so why would we expect the government to come in and help us out? Sure, yeah. Right, you run your own business, you know, you know what it's like, you know, we, we make our own things. So, right. you know, being here, that's a good thing because, you know, you you create those barriers, you create those those um, protection areas, mm. and boom, you know. So, so let me. So, what made, what made you guys decide, or what made you decide to say, "I'm going to come to Dubai"? You know, coffee business. 
you know, you're from New Zealand, lovely place, a lot of nature. Uh, you know, my dream one day if I retire is to go to somewhere in Southeast Asia and maybe have like a little bar. And if it's not coffee or a little kind of obscure bar, maybe like sell mag- magic mushrooms to like tourists. And <laughs> so I think being in the hospitality business, you want to be like, what, what about saying I want to start a coffee business in Dubai out of all the places? And, and how did that decision happen? And, and raw coffee, what, what was the idea that made okay, it? Okay, so I have a place in Gili. <laughs> just off Lombok, where okay. they have sell magic mushrooms to tourists. Um, so I've got one of those, yes, and that's definitely um, definitely something that you should do. Um, what made me come here was my wife is actually an air traffic controller. Oh, okay. And uh, I had worked for, for many years, and she had supported me in, in doing my work, working in telecoms and things. And she said, listen, if I want to do something, I want to, um, you know, I want to go to the place that's going to have the busiest airport in the world, and, you know, it's my turn. So we moved here. And I uh, went and talked to uh, lovely people at the local telecoms and realised that they were so far behind what I'd been doing that I didn't want to repeat what I'd been doing for seven, eight years. Right. So um, happened through friends to meet Kim and realised that you know I could bring something to a business, not just the fact that we actually needed a decent coffee, mm. but I could actually bring my business experience to her passion. And um, it just worked out. The timing was fantastic, and so we uh, we kicked off, you know, raw version two, yeah. as it was back then. Um, yeah, so that's that's why we're here. And it, it's actually hard to think back that long ago. Dubai was a, such a different place. Like you couldn't buy screws at the hardware store if you didn't speak Urdu. Yeah, you know, it was it was a it was the wild west, but it was also kind of exciting in that way. Yeah, the education here was better than we could get in New Zealand. It, it, For it your co- kids. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it cost a huge amount of money, mm. but you know, when you had companies back then that were prepared to pay that money to bring expertise, yeah. you know, it was uh, you know, it was just the best thing to do. Makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I have to say, like when I first, I, I, I actually it was due to COVID that I even came across Raw and somebody who like drinks coffee every day and I lived in uh, New York and Brooklyn and Manhattan. I lived in East London. You get some of the best coffee houses in these cities like very authentic, very kind of like unique and obscure. And, and I mean, the f- coffee is also fucking amazing. Then you come to Dubai, right? And then the city is amazing in many, many ways, but the coffee is shit. Oh, it's just terrible. It's really bad. Like yeah. you go to like, I mean, if it's, don't even, I'm not even going to comment on like the chains like Starbucks and Costa. Like they make basic, I mean, the food is actually better than the coffee they make, if anything. But then there is no really good coffee here. And I was just dazzled by raw. Um, not only is the coffee amazing, we'll talk about that in a second, but you guys created like a one-stop shop for all things coffee, for wholesalers and for retailers. So equipment, lessons, teaching people how to do the barista, like the barista course, which I, by the way, took online with the, one of your, I, mean, I forgot her name, but she was incredible over Zoom. So COVID uh, responsible. But I now make coffee like a barista, right? And this machine, Rocket R60, which I know you also provided your store. So how did you go from saying, look, let's have a coffee house to like, let's just do everything coffee. Uh, what, what sort of drove that decision and and because I think that's really what sets apart mm. raw from everybody else. So in New Zealand, we we have a bunch of villages. You know, New Zealand is a very advanced place where the the earliest adopters of any technology. We love something new. Um, today, I was very proud as a New Zealander that we won the America's Cup. Congratulations! Again, yeah, <laughs> using technology actually shows that Kiwi Kiwis yeah. can fly. Um, it, it, it so when I've been growing up as a child, I remember the weekend sport. My dad used to take me from if I was playing cricket or soccer or rugby or whatever I was playing, and we would stop on the way home to go to the Jewish deli and we'd pick up bagels and we'd go to the coffee uh, roastery and pick up coffee, and that was just the way that it worked. And mm. you know, with my kids on the you know when they were finishing on a Saturday, we'd go by the coffee roastery as well. So you were used to having fresh coffee and that's as simple as it gets you know coffee should be fresh Mm. and so when we moved here it was like uh where do we get the coffee um (laughs) oh there's some guy who there's a roastery and they roast nuts yeah okay and you go in there and there was this black oily guck and it was like this stuff's rancid before you even start it's been roasted months ago or whatever and it was like a panic set in, literally a panic set in. Mm. You know, just like, don't you understand this? Is, you should treat this just like any fresh product. So, you know, we, it's, it, it, when you 
when you suddenly realize that you're in a place that doesn't have what you are so used to, I suddenly went, hmm, okay, maybe I could actually roast coffee. So I, I, I contacted um, the roaster who uh, I was buying from and said, I've got a business opportunity up in Dubai. I think that we could possibly do this. And he said, yeah, look, I'm, I'm keen on this. Um, let's investigate it. So I started doing a bit of business planning and working out what it is. And then I met Kim and realized that, you know, there was no reason for me to, to repeat what she had started. Why don't we actually work together? And then when we started to meet each other and we worked out that we could actually do this probably together better than individuals competing against each other. Sure. But to be honest, if you can remember back in the day, you you didn't have to be the best in the world to be successful. True. So we got lucky. Like our business would have failed 20 times over if we'd been in our home country. Right. So we had an opportunity to try and really put our passion into it and that was more, that was the benefit. I didn't, I had, my wife was working, Kim's uh, husband was working and we didn't have to rely on them every day to, we didn't need salaries. So sure, we didn't pay ourselves for many, many years. That's amazing. But what does that saying go? Like uh, mother, uh, the need is the mother of invention, right? So like a combination of, you need that product for yourself first and foremost, but also like it lacks in Dubai where, I mean, there's just not a good coffee house in the city, except for, in my opinion for raw, but like very few others that don't even come close. Um, but something like that is, is, is all it takes to just be like, let's just do it ourselves and, and, and not wait for it to, to, to be done by somebody else. Right? The satisfaction of creating something yourself is greater than anything else. Sure. So, yeah. you know, I think about the coffee that we were making 10, 12 years ago and it was was better than whatever everybody else had in town yeah. but it wasn't very good yeah what we've learned is so it's a very interesting situation the middle east has the ability to bring everything to it whenever they want because there's lots of money sure right yeah. so does that make it the best not necessarily i think that sometimes and one of my frustrations um about being here is that people don't add value mm. My job is to add value. Yeah. So my job is to add value to the farmer that we buy from, to the team that we have. You know, all these value adds are the thing that I bring to the table. Right. And that's what makes our company. And what I hope is that what you experience when you come in is that feeling of 60 people adding value every day. 100%. Not just turning up. I actually, glad you mentioned farmers. I was going to ask you about that because as I was looking on your, you know, researching raw and your, yourself also on your website, reading the literature you have there. Um, it was mentioned several times and got my attention, the part on that your coffee is ethically sourced or sourced in, in a way. And it made me wonder how unethical is the value chain of the coffee industry? I mean, I'm, I'm oblivious about it. I know there's a lot of exploitation and, you know, sweatshops and for like the big companies and so on. But for coffee, very uh, oblivious and don't know much about it so maybe could you tell me a little bit about how uh, the ugly side of this industry and how you guys go about sourcing it ethically when you mentioned that yeah th there's a hugely ugly side to all food production you know there's a massive amount of companies out there that are taking advantage of people who are just not important to them um, we have been incredibly lucky in the sense that we've been able to start traveling about 2010 we started traveling to origin we first of all um, went and visited coffee competitions in the UK and thought that was important. And then once you actually go to the producing countries, you realise that that's where the most value you can add to the industry starts. Um, I'm proud to say that this year, 99.9% uh, .9 of the coffee that we've bought, I've shaken hands with the people who produce it. Lovely. You know, um, and that's that's quite a difference. And but what it means is not necessarily that I can pat myself on the back and say, "Aren't I a good person for making sure I know who made the coffee?" It's it's more important because we we can actually make a difference to the producers of the coffee. We can. There's there's little things that happen that once you go to an origin country Kim Kim says it better than I do but when you drive and you, you know you turn up in um, in a land cruiser you drive for 10 12 hours across very rough terrain and everything and you arrive in these villages 
immediately you can tell if the coffee's going to be good by the way that the children are, the way that the, the, the women who do most of the work um, are looking, you know, whether or not it's a positive vibe. It, 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 it completely changes the way the coffee tastes. Fascinating. But it's, but it's not. That's, that's normal human society, right? So is it the same logic that, um, uh, and by the way, if you want to... Before, oh, I forgot. I'm glad I remembered. Cheers, the customary cheers. Thanks for coming <laughs> on the show and for bringing this delicious bourbon. Um, got to fill you up as well. Mm -hmm. um, let me just push the ice towards you. And this. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I had, um, since you're mentioning the regions where the coffee is made and also the things like the children and how they are and the energy of the people who are making that coffee and how that immediately indicates to you how good the coffee is going to be. Um, I didn't even know this was, I was going to ask you about like the other aspects of making coffee, like washed versus natural, which I only also learned about from uh, drinking uh, coffee at raw. The region, I know that may plays a big factor. So I want to ask you about that. The dark versus medium roast, also curious to ask about that. But so these were the three variables that I thought come into the coffee making um, or the roasting uh, process. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the, that point on energy and, and about the mothers and the kids and how that also sort of makes its way to the coffee you drink. Because in many ways, when you're cooking food, like I, I, I get skeptical sometimes about people who are too like into this energy talk. But to some extent, I have to admit it's true. When you make food with love and with like a little bit of kindness and compassion, you can almost feel like you're going you're gonna to get that delivered through in, as, as a good flavor or as, as, as a good meal or a good beverage to your guests or to your family. So is this sort of what you're indicating here or am I misunderstanding it? No, not at all. Uh, look, so uh, I'm very much like you. Uh, you know, like I... Um, I have a mother who's a white witch. Uh, Same, by the way. <laughs> um, and and they're, they're, they're wonderful people. But, you know, I've been brought up with energy uh, being a, a topic in our house uh, on one side of our, of our family um, for many years. And I 100% believe in, in that there is a transference of energy that's going around the world. And, you know... <sighs> It, what's what's really interesting is that Kim and I often say that things happen to us at the right time, and that has happened to us in our business so many times with people that we meet or things that happen, uh, you know, as we're as we're doing business. And I and I think that you can't be lazy. I think that you have to, you know, you have to work for what you're doing. But I also think that if you have, you know, a belief in something. That often that will that will sway in a thing. Like I, I was saying to um, uh, some of the ladies that I work with who do our marketing and things the other day, I said, you know, it would be good if I could actually do a podcast. And they said to me, you know, why? I said, because often the conversation that I have about coffee is really, really short. But coffee, I could talk for 20 hours about coffee, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and 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 I think that what we're finding now in the Middle East is that we have jumped into this new coffee realm. Everybody's getting into it. And what's really cool and also really sad is that a lot of people here have never drunk bad coffee or they've forgotten what bad coffee is because they went from the terrible stuff that was available to the best of the best of the best. Right. And so now it's time to actually understand why it's good. And do you have to buy the best coffee? Do, can you buy an okay coffee and make it better? Right, because making it is also, you know, really, really important. Sure. Most people don't realise <clears throat> that most of the coffee farmers that that are producing the coffee that everybody's enjoying, they don't drink coffee. They can't afford to. Of course. But that's 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 wrong. Yeah. Right. You know, so if if we can go back down to the farm and work out how that we can help that farmer not get out of that subsistence life. That they, that they only have the small amount of coffee that they produce every year, and that's hopefully going to feed their family. Mm. And, 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 you know, we're worried about, you know, whether or not it's, you know, what score it is. You know, like, there's a disconnect there. We have, to, we have to get around that. So, you know, what is fantastic for us as a business right now is that Kim and I actually have the influence with the people that we're dealing with, with you, the customer, mm -hmm. to be able to say, stop. Would you like to learn about this farm? Would you like to learn about why it's important? You know, you can enjoy the coffee. We'll make sure that it's the best tasting coffee you get. 
But let's talk about what we can actually do to help these farmers. One of it's buying their coffee every year. That's fantastic. Sure. And hey, you know, we're, we're not a charity. You know, we, we sure. are, we're a for-profit business. Uh, I think for fair and reasonable profit. But, you know, the most important discussion that we have to have is if you want to continue drinking the coffee that you're drinking now in 10 years' time, that we have to start looking back at the farms that are producing it. We have to look about the water that they that they can use. We have to look about whether or not, um, you know, that that we are doing the right things with the climate to be able to do that. I'm, you know, I I love trees, but I'm a tree hugger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Fair enough. And, and and the thing is, I mean, you the regions that we talk, we're, we're talking about. Which regions here? We're talking about areas like that are extremely. Um, like developing countries, right? So this is like Ethiopia, mm-hmm. Sumatra, um, um, obviously Colombia, maybe a little bit more developed. But I guess even when you become a farmer, it doesn't much matter. And if you're in these countries, which are already a developing country, and you're also a farmer, then you're probably going through a hard time for like, economically, if nothing else. Um, never mind political oppression, whatever that might be, and so on. So what? what how? Like, what do you guys do aside of obviously selling the coffee of? Um, that, that comes out of these farmers and from these uh, areas, um, how do you then do more than just that? What are some of the things you've done to educate the customers about where this coffee is coming from or otherwise? Uh, you know, you mentioned you go there and you actually meet these people in person, you shake their hands. I think this is amazing. Um, what is the reaction that you're getting from those farmers compared to the other um, uh, suppliers that these farmers give their coffee to from you guys like are, what's the extra mile that you're going there uh, could you shed some light on that so there's the 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 purely capitalistic tangible benefit that we give so um, one of the uh, businesses that we work through um, uh, a lot is uh, is a company called Raw Material. Um, Raw Material is a collective of incredibly intelligent people who have looked not just on the you know the purely ethical side of the business. They look at it and go, okay, what can we do? Mm. So I. I'm really happy that uh, over the last three years, we can tangibly measure that we've paid 2.66 times the value to the farmer more than what they would have got on the open market. Oh, wow. Okay, that's great. Now, does that affect you as a consumer? Yes, it does. But do I really think that that makes too much of a difference to you? Not really. Lovely. So, so you're passing on an extra, the farmer obviously is doubling or tripling whatever they are making to them that could be life changing. Uh, Completely. Because I mean, a coffee farmer, the average coffee farmer, when it was last measured by um, different associations, the average coffee farmer was earning $600 per year. Oh my God. Right. So it's $2 a day, basically. Basically. Or $3 now, $3. they have, they probably grow their own food. They, you know, doing everything. But they were, you know, there's, there's some amazing documentaries out there that showed people that were in coffee were three months of the year, they were basically starving. Mm. So, you know, now we're, now we're, you know, the specialty coffee world is very, very small, right? Mm. The, the, the commodity coffee world is taking most of the coffee and, and that's not contributing. Mm. A huge amount of coffee farmers that, that I know, if they weren't being, um, using the word supported is, is, is immature, if, if we weren't buying from them, they would rip their coffee trees out and plant something else. Yeah. Right. So what we do is we try and encourage them in a commercial way because, I mean, we have to run a business. We have to make a profit. Right. Um, And, you know, to try and get these farmers to convince that we will support them for not just one year, two years or three years, that we are there to support them um, is the most important thing. Mm. Um, You know, and and there's a – it's – it's it's a challenging situation. I mean, mm. COVID was you know it was a, the amount of calls that I had with with farmers, and I'm going, look, you know, we you know we will do everything we can. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know whether or not we can sell what we've even got in the fridge at the moment. Right. And what's been interesting is that 
you know, people like yourself, you know, made it made a huge difference. You know, that impact was like, okay, so what can we do? Okay, yeah. this is not just about us. This is about you. This is about your survival, mm. right? Because I want to be able to buy your coffee next year. So what do we need to do? How, yeah. you know, how much do we need to send you or what can we do? We had a terrible situation that the middle of uh, May, mm -hmm. I was meant to be taking a bunch of people down to Rwanda um, for a uh, for a trip down to see the whole coffee process, which is just the most amazing place to go and see coffee is Rwanda. And they had a flood, and that flood killed twenty three people. It wiped out over two million coffee trees. You wow. know, so we are in the middle of a COVID situation, and we have people who literally are homeless. They've lost their loved ones. They've lost their livelihood, and what was amazing is that the coffee community that I work in, the raw material community, um, was able to actually fundraise, and we were raising money during COVID that's for these people, just to give them, the, you know, and, and and that's the difference when you're working with people who are generally, you know, want to do good in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, if nothing else, on a selfish level, of course, not just selfishly, but I would want these farmers to like <laughs> continue to exist and be okay because I like my coffee. And I mean, of course, that's not the right reason to do it. But like, I mean, I can imagine if you're very, if you love your coffee and you love where it's coming from, you're going to want to do everything to help the people who are, you know, busting their ass to get that coffee out for you, um, uh, you know, for, for just to kind of especially for us who are privileged enough to be in Dubai where as you said you know you can pay twice the price of a cup of coffee instead of a 15 or 20 dirham espresso I'll pay 30 35 if that means that I can keep the value chain alive especially the, the people that matter the most at the beginning of the value chain um, then it makes it makes a lot of sense um, I think that what we're going to have to do is work out who's making the money right and and that's the that's the stuff that Kim and I are working on hopefully in the next couple of months we're going to be able to announce what we're working on which is to guarantee that you know that the money's going in the right place right right because there are, you know a bit of accountability the, the, too. this is a capitalistic society and there's nothing wrong with capitalism yeah right so but but you know there are a lot of people who um, ride on the the coattails of of a new enterprise um, sure. You know the coffee, the coffee business in in Dubai has. Um, I'm I'm smirking because you know there's a lot of people have taken advantage of a trend, yeah. and that's fine. But you know I think that it'll all come and equalise itself because you know it's it, it's going to be that that we're going to find some genuine. It, it, a lot of people are going to not be able to survive the current economic climate, right? Which is a good thing. Yeah, you know. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, and so, in terms of the regions, that's going to be aside of which one was. I guess everybody got affected quite badly, and even outside of COVID, uh, these regions are dealing with God knows what. Where do you typically see the highest demand? for your beans, um, so your customers, which beans do they typically like? The ones from Colombia, uh, uh, Sumatra, uh, Ethiopia. My favorite is Sumatra, by the way. And I was trying to wonder, I mean, I love to drink espresso every day. So I do this, you know, exactly as I was taught by your barista, 25, 30 second extraction. Um, you know, I get the grind level uh, to give me twice as much. So I put 19 grams of beans. It gives me 38 grams of extraction within 25 to 30 seconds. And I've tried all your beans. I love the black tie. I love, uh, you know, the LBD, the, was it the working, um, the Ethiopian one. But my favorite one is the Sumatra one, which I know is washed and I know it's medium. And I don't know why I like it the most. It has a sandy, almost sandy. I'm going to use that adjective for the lack of a better one. But it has this like foamy, sandy texture that I love for an espresso. So what goes on into the making of the coffee, the region, that's roasting, that makes espresso or coffee like, people like coffee or espresso the way they do? The most exciting thing for me is you to say that because the best coffee that you can drink is the one that you love the most. Oh, for real? It, 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 the Sumatra like, one. Like, like why, why, you know, but, but we, we spend too much time telling each other what's the best, right? That coffee is not my favorite. I know a lot about it and what you're doing by buying that coffee yeah. is actually helping a lot of people and helping a lot of orangutans. But, but you know, like if you, if you literally take that coffee and you put it on the world scale of the best coffees in the world, eh, it's not already there, but you love it. So it's the perfect coffee for you. It is, yeah. Right? Um, you know, you, you were saying before, you know, what, you know, what is the, the most... Uh, the, the most favorable coffees and things. 
Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. Mm. So out of Ethiopia, there's over 150 different varieties that have been mapped. The rest of the world has maybe 15 varieties. Slowly, we're exporting them quietly from Ethiopia and planting them around the world. Um, we have a, uh, a coffee that we're getting out of Colombia that is an exported coffee from Ethiopia that's been now being grown in Colombia through different uh, ways that we transport things around the world, um, which is amazing. If Ethiopia ceases to exist, then coffee ceases to exist because it's only a matter of time until disease or whatever destroys those species that have been liberated from Ethiopia. So that's a problem. And right now Ethiopia is in a terrible economic situation, mm. um, terrible social economic situation as well. Um, this year has been incredibly difficult to get coffee from Ethiopia. Yeah. And we're really lucky that we actually have some producers down there that we they know that we're going to need it, so you know they we we're the first on the the first ones to get it. Yeah. Um, and Ethiopia, I have to say, is probably the place that I love most the coffee. Right. Colombia, oh my god, Colombia, you must go. Okay. Oh, as a country, it is just amazing. Yeah. The food in Colombia, the people, everything about Colombia is amazing, and you'd you'd think that there's other things like. You'd think that cocaine is, is really, <laughs> really big in Colombia. No, it's not. Coffee's actually, I think, the 29th biggest export out of Colombia. Right. Right? I think cocaine is like the 40th export. They yeah. export more rice than they export coffee. I guess with the cocaine, it's probably exported in like a black market, so it's not being tracked as much with the Escobars and whatnot. No, nah, you'd be quite surprised. We One of the coffees that you have probably drunk from us, mm. and in fact, if you drunk, uh, most of our blends actually contain one Colombian coffee, which is from Planetis, which is where the fuck have controlled the entire... Um, region for many many years so they uh they disassociated themselves with the rest of colombia and they oh, really? Sorry, the, the FARC? FARC. okay yeah so it's in northern uh tolima um we were incredibly lucky two years ago to go up there and i i believe that we were one of the first um people outside of south america to visit there um there wasn't even a road in there before we went in uh about six months before we went in there they built a road and mm. and they were producing huge amounts of cocaine um and what's kind of funny is you get you get there and you talk to them they're brilliant people because you go okay so um what happened they said well the colombian government turned around and said that they were going to pay us to remove the cocaine we went, okay, yeah, so what did you do? Well, we planted more cocaine <laughs> <laughs> so we could make more money. I mean, literally, uh, this area went from producing something like 70,000 tonnes of cocaine per year to producing 210,000 cocaine. Right. You know. But then, then they sort of also realised that, I mean, they're not consuming it, right? It doesn't destroy their society. They, they use, they chew the coca leaf, they, they do it, you know, just as a normal part of society. But they're also producing coffee. Right. They're producing amazing, amazing uh, cacao for chocolate. Right, um, and the cacao grows just below the coffee. Yeah. So you know they they've got this whole production of growing coca, cacao, and right. uh, coffee, um, and they're really happy. Yeah. You know, yeah. They <laughs> little, I mean, I also understand they have to go through quite a bit of the leaves in order to create the extract of cocaine, whatever that is. I think you have to go through quite a bit to get the pure cocaine out. Of the, then yeah. So I actually spent quite a lot of time talking to uh, guys about what the difference was because one of the things that they have is there's only a certain amount of people. Right, so when it comes to coffee, um, you know, harvest, there is a draw on the community on how many people you can get to harvest. And so, coffee is a cherry that grows on a tree, and it's ripe at a certain time, and you need to you need to harvest it when it's ripe. Mm. So at the same time, you know, the cocaine is ready on the tree, the cocoa is ready to be plucked. So it's very easy to pr process the the leaves because all they do is they strip it. They mm -hmm. strip it from the tree, and then it goes off. They just make bales of it. With a with a coffee, they're wanting to pick individual cherries, and it's much harder work. Right. And so there's always that sort of balance between, and the people that I've talked to in Colombia have been going, well, you know, I know it's better to do this, but this pays more. <laughs> Fair. Makes sense. <laughs> and you also mentioned Ethiopia, right? And I know quite a bit about Ethiopia by now because um, I'm actually, I didn't ask you that earlier before we started, but how well do you know um, the cryptocurrency Cardano and Charles Huskinson? 
Um, so this guy is started this, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Bitcoin and now there's quite a few other projects. Um, if you, since Ethiopia is like you know, at the forefront of coffee, mm-hmm. this is where it's going to, um, this is where the renaissance, uh, if you wish, economically speaking, in Africa is going to start through this uh, project called Cardano. Um, very smart guy called Charles Hoskinson. Um, he's uh, a mathematician. He's actually now like the third biggest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin and Ethereum as of today. I'm invested like balls deep into this project now (laughs) and a very proud investor, to be honest, because this guy goes on and says, like, you know, if you're buying the coin for Cardano and you're trying to just make some quick buck, like get out of this project right now and go buy a bunch of other ones. But he is really on a mission to bank the unbanked in Africa and we give the unbanked in Africa, like the farmers, I imagine, in Ethiopia are a good example, uh, but probably many other, uh, you know, individuals in, in Africa and professionals who just need some help uh, bank if, across the different services that you could need as a as, as a person from uh, getting a loan to uh, being able to mortgage something to getting an insurance um, and everything in between right so um, hopefully something like uh, this kind of uh, cryptocurrency age that we're living in and other things that could happen will now bring up bring these countries up to speed so that they can compete on a global scale without having to get exploited and and, and, and hope that they can get some ethical buyers much like you guys to kind of keep them uh, afloat right so i mean the stuff that we're that kim and i are working on at the moment requires the blockchain i mean it, it needs that and it also needs a cryptocurrency that can be um used in places like South America and and Africa. I mean, you've got to remember that that a lot of these people are living hand to mouth, right? They they will carry their water for two and a half kilometers every day. They'll send their children at three years old with a one litre bottle to go and fill it up with water, you know. So, you know, know, I've got friends who have millions of dollars stuck in Ethiopia. They can't remove it because the, um, the governments there re- control the burr and they won't let it get transferred. Like when we, when we buy coffee in Ethiopia, for example, we have to pay through the central bank and, you know, my producers are not getting their money released by the central bank, you know? Like it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. And if we can, now we have the mobile phone. Right, so now we have a device that can carry a transaction, and if we can enable the transaction down to literally the people who need that, mm-hmm. it will work. I think we're a long way away from that. We are, we are. As with everything, even browsing the web and even emails and everything, like so, it'll take time. But I think one thing I've noticed in this world, the tech world, is that so many people are skilled now and are developed that you know things that would have normally taken five to seven to ten years. 20 years ago, now just need like a year or two. Like there's so many crypto projects out there. How did so many of them come up suddenly um, when we nobody's really even using crypto yet? And yet you have so many of these companies out, which means that, you know, a lot of those tech geeks, guys, very smart people are able to get those different, differentiated projects out when there's not even enough demand for them yet. So have you dealt with Providence? No, not yet. Okay, so Providence is the most important thing that's going to be added to the blockchain, right? Mm-hmm. So Providence proves the blockchain in, in way, way more. And, but Providence isn't the blockchain. So that's the next thing that's going to happen, right? So if I can give you an example. Yeah. If you go on a holiday and you go on a coffee holiday and you're going to go and see processing of coffee from a natural to a white coffee and go and see the gorillas in in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You know, wonderful week-long holiday suggests that when we get out of COVID, everyone does it. It's amazing. So what happens when you're, you're down there and you take a photo? And you take a photo of a a child that doesn't really look like they should be where they should be. And I, you know, like when you go to a coffee processing facility, seeing children, you should do that because sure. the whole, you know, the whole process is about a family oriented. It's a village, and you know, and and that's important. But you see that that child is obviously not very well or whatever. Now you have a some metadata on your phone. You upload that to the cloud. Provenance will then prove whether or not one of those companies is buying coffee from a place that's using child labor. Oh, wow. Very right? cool. Now, so that's the type of thing that's going to make a difference. Now, sure, yeah. you add a cryptocurrency to it. To right? incentivize. Which, which, yeah. which can help the, um, which, which can help the, the whole um, 
the whole system of making sure that you can provide yeah. for people, that's going to make a massive difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but but we need we need some big banks behind it. We yeah. need some big banks who can get down to the level of being able to pay your power and pay your water and pay your phone before that's going to work, right? <clears throat> well, that's uh, yes. So, uh, on the one hand, we need big banks traditionally, as we do today. But I think the beauty of crypto is that they have this new thing called decentralized finance, which allows those crypto projects to really replace those big banks through um, peer-to-peer lending without the need of big banks. Yeah, but I don't agree with you because. Mm. I cannot get trade finance for my business, right? I'm a very secure, right? Mm. I've got a balance sheet that that people would get quite excited about, right? So I've got all the right things going and I cannot get trade finance because the product I'm purchasing is only worth the value that I'm prepared to pay, right? Because there's not a stated value for the coffee that I'm buying because the people who have the power want to drive the price of coffee down to as low as possible because it's a commodity, mm-hmm. right? So they might say that the coffee that I'm buying is worth $1 a kilo. As opposed to f- as to As opposed 10. to 10 15 right. 30 yeah. 50 $100 a kilo. But these are the big finance, these are the big banks, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. But this, so it's still very theoretical at this point, so let's see if it actually comes through. But the idea of this kind of decentralized finance world is that if, you're, if the invoices or whatever is on your balance sheet that can really authenticate the demand and the value that you have for your coffee is truly worth $10 instead of a dollar, right. you should be able to collateralize that, tokenize it, and basically uh, go as far as you're mortgaging uh, what would be uh, an unofficial asset by a normal bank by these new financing fees? Again, it's all theoretical at this point. So, no, uh, you, today who is using DeFi? Only the the market participants who are in the crypto space. Usually, the miners and other crypto projects. So, somebody like me or like you, not yet. Theoretically speaking, I can see how it could work. But let's see if it does. This could really. I mean, I don't. Th- See how banks could be relevant anymore when you could just get a proper loan in fiat, in dollars or dirhams, whatever you oh, want. I'm gritting like a Cheshire cat. Give me three months and I'll show you how we're going to do it. Seriously. Um, uh, provenance is the key. Yeah. Is actually being able to provide that 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 provenance that guarantees that you, what you're seeing on the blockchain is is real. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, and so the, you know, the, there are some stuff that's that's coming out, and 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 this is going back to the coffee industry, right? So the yeah. coffee industry is basically now made up of people who are capitalists, right? Because the specialty coffee industry is about people going, oh. That's kind of good. It doesn't really hurt anybody. We're adding value to other people. So now you've got a whole bunch of very, very intelligent people joining that industry. And they're going, okay, so how do we make it end-to-end better? Yeah. Right? It's not just about making a coffee on your coffee machine. It's about making the whole chain better. The interesting thing is that the worst coffee can also be the best coffee. So if I can support a farmer who can actually grow that tree better – then I'm going to actually I'm going to increase the value of that tree exponentially. Right, because you're doing all the things that you can do after you get the beans from the roasting process and everything to get it to a point where I wouldn't even be able to tell if this is coming from a score 10 to a, or a score 5 because of the process that happens after you source the beans, but even better when the beans themselves have been improved, yeah. right? So if the tree, is, the tree is healthy, the tree is mature, you know, the, the, the soil is better and all that sort of stuff. So like we, we, um, we've been assisting with, um, you know, by buying the coffee with uh, farmers who just basically going and looking at their soil. So one of the things that um, our lovely friends at Monsanto, bunch of pricks, um, <laughs> Monsanto basically did is said they invented this product called Roundup. And Roundup is um, basically what it does is it, sl- it stops the uptake of chloroform into a plant. So you spray it on something and weeds won't grow. So you genetically engineer a plant to be resistant to Roundup and you can grow that. So one of the things that they did was soy. So they took soya beans, they made a genetic version of soya beans, you spray Roundup on everything, it kills everything else in the soil, only the soya will grow. Now the problem with that is that the genetic ownership is owned by Monsanto. So Monsanto then can only sell you the seeds. And what they also do is make that the genetic engineering that those seeds will not re regenerate oh wow. so you have to buy the seeds every year and this uh, happened uh, i'm not sure how many years ago i think six or seven years ago in india where they were given free seeds to grow soya the next year they took the seeds and they replanted them they didn't grow and they said no you have to buy more 
So, you know, we had all these Indian farmers committing suicide because, you know, one harvest. Um, wow. yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible thing. So Roundup, I remember when I was, you know, 20 years ago in New Zealand and I, you know, would spray it on my driveway to stop the weeds growing through my concrete. You know, that was a wonderful product. Now I realised how bad that is. And guyanus phosphate, which is what Roundup is, if you go to um, Cambodia, if you go to Vietnam, you know, you see it being sprayed everywhere now on rice and they've re-engineered this stuff. Now, guyana phosphate is not a good thing in your body and we're just slowly ingesting it. So one of one of the things that I, that you know, through the guys I'm working with in Colombia and stuff is they've worked out if they put massive amounts of lime back onto the soil that's had guyana phosphate on it, it actually returns the soil back to normal. Interesting. Right now, an average farmer who's using 600, earning $600 a year, you say to him, you've got to go and put $1,000 worth of phosphate on your farm and then we can plant some coffee trees and then we can grow coffee. He's going to go, yeah, but what do I eat? So you know, if we, if we can start to work at a micro level and start to help these people and start mm-hmm. to change it, you know, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, we're going to be in a better place. Sure. Right? And we're going to be drinking better coffee than we've ever drunk before. Right. Because, you know, we've got the technology, we understand it, you know, we've got people who, you know, know how to, you know, for me to arrange to take seeds from one country to another as long as I stick with biosecurity rules (laughs) is relatively simple because I used to fly all over the world. Right. Right. You know, and I can take a couple of kilos of, of seeds uh, from one country to another. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, the, the, the farmer that's receiving those seeds has no idea how, what these are. They have no right. idea that you're drinking a hundred dollar geisha. Yeah. hundred you know? percent. I actually don't think we, we pay enough for coffee considering how much we like it, but that's again, privileged Dubai residents, me. <laughs> um, but I hear what you're saying and, and I'm optimistic about like what how, even better improving because you, you can still get good coffee under the shitty circumstances that we're in right now. Like not us, I mean, sorry, the farmers. So you can only imagine how the only way is, is from here is, is up basically. Right. I mean, in theory. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of those farmers were abandoned by their, their governments, mm. you know, during the COVID times. Right. And, and, yeah. you know, there was a lot of trouble to move, uh, coffee from one place to another. You mm-hmm. know, you think about it that if a, if a truck can't drive from one place to another, you know, how are they going to actually move the coffee around? Sure, yeah. Um, we were, you know, we were lucky. Um, we we had uh, coffee moving. Like I, I said it before, you know, we, we think a lot of the stuff that we do is good luck rather than good management. Um, but we had containers on the water when COVID hit. And so those containers eventually got to us. But a, a lot of people I know, they ran out, Yeah, you know. Um, and or they had to buy coffee that was second rate, or a, a lot of places couldn't harvest. Yeah, right. They just couldn't get couldn't get people because there was restrictions that meant that people couldn't actually get in to do harvest. So it's been yeah. a it, the coffee the coffee world is going to be a bit but upset this season because mm. you remember that the stuff you're drinking was harvested last year. Right. Fair. 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 So let me ask you about espresso, particularly because I am a big espresso drinker. Um, I only discover. Okay, let me tell you the kind of the context of this upcoming question. I drink what is it, two espressos a day, maybe three sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I did not know. And I also at one point proposed to. So okay, so basically, um, I learned a couple of years ago that diamonds have the four C's: clarity, color, carrot, and uh, I think what's the fourth C. Carity, you sacrificed uh, two months of your salary, did you? <laughs> yeah, so that's the rule, right? Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I think I had to come up with a different formula at the time, but uh, I did what I did. But there were four seeds for diamonds, and then I turns out, and when I got this Rocket R60 machine, that uh, brewing espresso has something called the four M's, which are, according to the catalog from Rocket R60, the Macchinatura, the Miskela. Actually, I'm, let me read this out. Espresso coffee brewing is defined by the four M's. The Machinatura is the correct grinding of a coffee blend. Miskela is the coffee blend. Machina is the espresso machine. And Mano is the skilled hand of the barista. So when we just get an espresso shot, there are different things going on. And each one of those four M's apparently play a different role in how good the espresso uh, shot that you're getting is. Tell us about those four M's and, and, and like educate us on, on, on what's going on here in the espresso making part. The Italians 
are the masters of making machinery, right? You, you have to, right? If, you, if you've if seen anything that comes out of Italy, I mean, New Zealand just beat the Italians with the sailing today, which was fantastic. But, you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's even more... Um, lovely to 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 best an Italian because they do their, their, whatever Italy makes is beautiful machinery wise mm-hmm. their coffee is shit like a Ferrari yeah Ferrari is beautiful but their coffee is shit right so the Italians even the Italians that I know and I've met some people who are very high up in the Italian coffee industry and they admit now that their coffee is shit because what they did is that they took what was a beautiful seed and they over roast it. They mm-hmm. make it super, super dark and but they make the best equipment. One of the things that a lot of Italian companies have suddenly realized, especially the uh, equipment manufacturers, is that water is more important than anything else. <laughs> so you think about an espresso, it's twenty five to thirty mils. In that ninety nine point three percent of it is water. So if the water is not right to start off with, you, your espresso is going to taste terrible, right? right? So in Dubai, we have a problem with water. We have very, very safe, beautiful systems. We have everything, but uh, the water here um, is desalinated and it contains a mineral that is um, not bad for our body. In fact, our body requires it. In fact, a lot of the stuff that happens in your brain requires chlorides and we have a huge amount of chlorides in our water here and 10 years ago the chloride level here was very low now it's got higher I don't know why I take a guess that we're desalinating more water and then we're using the same water over and over again the chloride level's gone up but that's just a guess the chloride loves eating stainless steel okay right so your coffee machine is made out of copper and stainless steel Mm-hmm. And so it eats that. And chlorides also make uh, espresso, especially because that's a concentration of uh, coffee. It makes it taste bitter and sour. So um, the number one thing is use the right water. And I hate to say this, but the best water that you can use in Dubai um, is either Cokes or Pepsis. So Awa or Aquafina. Oh, right. Is it okay. Aquafina? Like a, yeah, 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 right. Aquafina is Pepsi and uh, yeah, okay. Arua. Yeah. Do you know why? Because these guys know how to make a soft drink, right? So they know that water is super important. Right. So they've got their water right. So the low chlorine version, because I think they have two different chloride. Dusky, chloride, sorry. Yeah, chlorine is chlorine is not not something we have here. Chloride, sodium. Ions. Sorry, I was thinking no? sodium in my head. So how do how so there's difference to the water in terms of the sodium and the chlorine, or just the chlorine, or so there is sodium, which is salt. Right. So what happens is that a um, little bit of chemistry here. Mm-hmm. When you when you desalinate water, you have NaCl, yep. sodium chloride. Right. That's the salt in the water, which is H two O. What the way the way that they desalinate is to push it through a membrane, which is like a really fine sort of filter, but it's not actually a filter. They have a high pressure, low pressure side. And what's meant to happen is that anything that is bigger than a hydrogen atom or an oxygen atom is not able to go through. Mm. But what happens is that the chlorides themselves actually go through, and there's a whole technical reason why they bypass and they send salt water around the, the thing because that's a little bit of salt's fine for us. Is that osmosis, by the way? It is reverse osmosis, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but reverse osmosis is meant to remove all the chlorides, but it doesn't in okay. our water that we have here. And, and that, um, those chlorides are just the enemy for your machine, and mm. it's also the enemy for the taste of your coffee. Right, right. Right. So if you can remove those, um, that's super, super important. Interesting. So the water as a base, very important. Yep. Then the other four M's. Basically. Right. Then yeah. grind is, is right. So when, you, when you're making coffee, what you're trying to do is get the solubles out of the coffee. Mm-hmm. Right. So the way that you do it is you take a big bean and you make that a thousand times smaller than what it was by grinding it. Mm-hmm. Now, the amount of the solubles that come into the water are determined by three things. The time, so the amount of contact time that the water has with the coffee. Mm -hmm. The temperature, so the higher the temperature, the faster the the solubles will move out. And the turbulence, so how much agitation. So in an espresso machine, you're talking about pressure. If you're talking about um, any other method where you're stirring or doing anything, that's also turbulence, right? Mm. So... When you're looking at the solubles that you want in the cup, 
there's good ones and bad ones. So if you take coffee and you soak it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and you stir it up at a really high temperature, it will taste terrible mm -hmm. because it's got the good things and the bad things, right? So, you know, you think about something lovely like this, mm -hmm. which has been distilled. We're wanting the good distillation, not the bad distillation. I don't right. know, you know, you, you, you um, like a single malt? Yeah. So when you're doing a distillation, you have the heads and the tails and the hearts, have you heard about this in no. distillation? Interesting. Okay, so at the start of a dis distillation, you have basically poison that comes off. You cannot drink it. So those poisons, um, we want to throw those away, and then that's called the heads, and then you have the hearts, which is all the beautiful, sweet, beautiful, nothing, and then you have the tails, which is the nasty stuff. In coffee, it's exactly the same. We have, well, not quite exactly the same. We don't have any poison at the front, but we have the, the nice stuff in the middle, and then we have the bad stuff at the end. And that bad stuff generally tastes bitter. <clears throat> so when you're making an espresso, for example, you want to make sure that you actually cut the process off in, an, in enough time that you're getting the best flavor. Mm. So 30 seconds, 25 to 30 seconds. Yeah, but so now we've got this whole complex thing. Yeah. So we've got the time that we're exposing, because you want to do 25 seconds. We've got the temperature, which is set on your espresso machine. But if you've got a bad espresso machine, it's going to vary, right? Right, Which is why your espresso machine is fantastic, because mm -hmm. it's stabilised. Um, but then you've also got the turbulence, whether or not the pressure is going to adjust. But then the grind, so the long story coming all the way back, if you've got a very, very good grinder it is going to give you exactly the same grind size all the way through. Right. right. And we're talking about microns. Sure. Right. So if you have a low quality grinder, what happens is that, that you have boulders and rocks and very, very fine particles as well. And it's going to extract at different times. And so some is going to come out really fast and some is going to come out slow. Oh, wow. That's like the opposite of a, sing of a single malt, right? So when you start getting multiple dist uh, distilleries mixed exactly. in. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So this is the thing is that the grinder, after the water, the grinder is super, super important. Right. You know, if you're going to, I say to people, forget the espresso machine. Buy the most expensive grinder that you can afford. I agree. Yeah. Right? And then once you've got that, then the machine, for all those reasons that I yeah. just said, you know, giving stability and all that sort of stuff, that's going to make a huge difference. I actually was not even aware. I'm going to go ahead and, and do some. Writing was until I got introduced to Raw. Um, this is your website. And you can basically see, um, by the way, hands, you know, honestly, um, touche. And kudos for an amazing online uh, ordering experience. I, I'm a tech geek myself. I love like I, my first company was a tech startup, so I know how, what goes through the user journey of developing these kind of like online platforms and so on. It, may, it might not be too advanced, but I know enough to know that this was not just like um, done quickly. And my marketing team is working on this furiously at the moment because they are not happy with it yet. So this is the people that I get to deal with now is that the most wonderful thing in my job is that we're now in a situation where we are able to employ people that are way better than us at doing yeah. a job. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, so this is like, look at that, for example. I mean, for the, anybody who's watching or sorry, anybody who's listening, we're looking at the Raw Coffee Company website and look at all these different options that you have for the grind. Let me just try to zoom in a bit. Um, the, the best thing you can do is buy your own grinder, to be honest. Right. But what we do is I think that we have about 16 or 17 different grind sizes that we measure. About once every two months we go through, it's a process, it's an ongoing process of trying to work out every coffee that we sell and then optimizing the grind size for that particular brewing process. Or the machine as well. Like I remember it's, when I went to your store, they had the grinds based on what machine do I have, right? So that's yeah, also yeah, which is something that we're constantly doing. And of course, coffee is also hydroscopic, so it's taking on water and letting off water as well. So we, you know, 
always best grind just before you make. Yeah. But we try and get it as right as possible by testing and testing and testing to make sure that this time of the year, that particular coffee with that brewing process is yeah. going to work. You can imagine how much work goes into it. I got, I got my personal trainer. I have a personal <laughs> trainer for my shoulder surgery, and now he's got his rocket, R, uh, not the R60, he's got a rocket machine. Um, I think it's apart, Apartamento. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's got the grinder, the sette. He's got the one that does the weight. Uh, mine doesn't do the weight. I do the weighting separately. And um, it's just a fascinating experience when you go into this process rather than just like getting it off the shelf. Have you got to the level where you're playing with it? Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. I mean, I, for, I have to waste two or three shots every time I get a new bean because I need to understand mm -hmm. the. But it's yeah, generally at a 2E, 2F, and then more or less, I never go down to one or over three. So somewhere it's always in the vicinity of a two. How, how are you finding when you want to manipulate the flavor? What, mm -hmm. Where have you got to when you want to manipulate flavor? Great question. So I have the Rocket R60, which um, allows me to um, adjust the pressure throughout the extraction. So one thing I could do is like put a pressure at like um, uh, usually like uh, at like around a seven or eight for the first 10 seconds, push it all the way up to like a 10 or 11 and then back to nine. That gives you kind of a mix throughout the sipping experience. That's one way to do it. Um, the other has just been the beans. Just like changing the beans, keeping it at a nine bar pressure, doing nothing else, same standard 25 to 30 second extraction to get double the amount of weight of beans, but just changing the beans, right? Like that's all I've done. I haven't played with anything else. Of course, I got to adjust the grinding so that I get the extraction done at the same time. But it's amazing how many different flavors of coffee you can get just by changing the bean, right? Like, and, and, and I still think the Sumatra you guys had, which I, I hope you bring it back. I think it was ran out, ran out of supply. You, you, there's no more available availability at, at Royal for the Sumatra one. But the next best one that I like is the Huatango, the, the Guatem Guatemala one, which when I, every time I go You're there. You're getting excited. Oh, we've got something coming for you. Yeah. Oh, the, the new Weiwei Tango is just spectacular. I've never had coffee from Guatemala this good. But here's the thing. I like, it seems like I like the washed ones more for espresso, where as when I go to the store and I, you know, I, I love having a chat with, with the guys there because they seem to know, like, just they describe to you what's going on with each bean and so on. Natural seems to be the main recommendation, but I seem to like the washed more when it comes to espresso. So yeah, what's going on here? It's because the bosses like naturals. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. I love natural coffee. Okay. And, you know... How does it affect the washed natural uh, in the process? Yeah. Look, so there's just more flavor in a natural, I think. D to be honest, the first time I ever tried a natural in 2010 in Ethiopia in a cupping lab, I hated it. I thought it was fermented. I thought it was just disgusting. I thought it was off. Mm. And then I started to understand what a natural means. Mm. To be fair, naturals, a lot of my friends who are, you know, international judges uh, for coffee competitions and everything don't like naturals. They like washed. And washed coffees give you a finer, uh, more exquisite flavor profile. Naturals, basically what the difference is, is that um, a natural coffee the uh, the fruit is picked, it's cleaned, and then the fruit is left to dry attached to the bean. So you get more fruit sugars, you get more flavors in there. And now in the last three, four years, we've been manipulating a lot of those flavors by using fermentations. Mm -hmm. So using uh, anaerobic, anaerobic fermentations. So without oxygen and with oxygen fermentations. And some extreme stuff like we've got some coffees now that we um, have been fermented for 120 hours which is just insane mm. you just don't do you didn't do this 10 years ago and these coffees have just such strong flavor profiles that I love them but I wouldn't drink them every day mm. like so my my go-to favorite coffee for the last three years for breakfast in the morning is a Mexican just a plain yeah. Mexican coffee I like that one too it's just beautifully chocolatey sweet and, you know, it just it's just a lovely coffee. Yeah. But I've got coffees that I can pick up 15, 20 different flavor notes in them. So here, here's a fun question here. Um, does preference in coffee have any indications about a person's personality? Or I think at one time I came across this article that said, you know, if you like this kind of coffee, 
this is what your preference in sex like bl- people who like black coffee are a certain type when it comes to sex or and then of course a lot of this might be conjecture but maybe from your own personal experience but also from what you've seen or maybe there's some science to back it up empirical or otherwise um is there any relationship between your preference to coffee and personality traits sex specifically and other things that you think there's a correlation there or um I think that there, there could be, but I also think that there's a huge amount of people who haven't had a really good coffee. Or good sex. Or good sex. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I, look, I, it's, it's really, I, I say to anybody, give me two months and you will be drinking single shot espressos. Right. Right? You can be drinking a you know half shot soy based latte with three sugars in it. Mm-hmm. You haven't had the right sugar yet, right? Right. Oh, sorry. You haven't had the right coffee yet. So, I think that there absolutely could be exactly the same reason as they haven't had the right sex. Yeah, as well, right? So, but the one that so it seems that in fact here, let me do this again. Um, pull this up. That was one article I came across just before our stream that says basically um, this is on Food Beast. Um, Zoom in a bit. Black coffee. Personality traits, old school, purist. Positives, patient, efficient, keeps things simple. Negatives, set in their ways and resistant to making changes. Abrupt, dismissive, quiet, and moody. I like my coffee black. And and this is not entirely wrong (laughs) um, about black coffee. Then you go down here, for example, for latte drinkers. And that's um, personality traits. Comfort-seeking people, pleasers, open books and like to soften the bitterness of life. Positives, generous with time and will go out of their way to help others. Kind of like what uh, pleasers do. Negatives can get overextended easily and don't always take good care of themselves. And we can go through this list, but we're not going to do that. And um, I just think generally, not just with coffee, um, your preference to food is, has, can say a lot about who you are as a person, how adventurous you can be, how bold you are, introvert versus extrovert. A lot of this can be conjecture, I'm sure, but... Um, It'll be interesting if you kind of give people coffee that is commensurate with their personality and looking and kind of tracking people and seeing how does that affect their productivity at work, their relationship with their partners. If you drink the coffee that is the right coffee for your type of personality, assuming there's any kind of relationship there, can you imagine for people starting off their day with the right cup of joe that is just the right type of, you know, you know how you say, like, for example, if you're in a certain blood type, you should not eat almonds, or if you have this kind of condition, you should eat fats of this type. So maybe something with coffee could be a catalyst to a better life here? Well, yeah, I, I would hope so. There's a lot of other things in my life that I think that there's an exact correlation to what you're saying. All right, hit, right? hit, us, hit us with it. So um, I, I have, I cut carbs out years ago. Uh-huh. And carbs are not good for me, but I actually realised that intermittent fasting is better for me. Oh, it's the best, right? So, um, I've lost twenty five kilos. Like, so COVID came, and you could you could uh, Netflix and pizza, <laughs> or you could just get off your ass and and do whatever you needed to do. And I, I'm lucky that I chose to get off my ass and do something about it. But, um. You know, like intermittent fasting works for me. Yeah, right? and especially if you mix it with like a no carb carnivore diet type thing. I don't know how. Well, it yeah, I, I did that. I did the full keto for a bit. Right. Um, I mean, I've, I one of my joyous uh, memories is the fact that my grandmother told me that black coffee is the only way to drink coffee because you know wasting milk or whatever. And I don't don't like milk, <laughs> right? Um, you know, but so you know, I, I've always you know said to people, you know, like, just just harden up. You know, just drink black coffee. Yeah. You know, and I'm lucky because I, you know, drink the best coffee all the time. So I can, I, you know, get the best taste profile. If you're drinking black coffee and it tastes like shit, mm. you're drinking the wrong coffee. True, true. Right? True. It's that simple. Like I gave you some um, some cold brew. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> you drink espresso. Yeah, this right? is delicious, by the way. I mean. And that's just caramel and malt. Yeah. Right? And it's just coffee and water. I think a shot of this is equal to like five espressos. Is, uh, what, what, uh, what's uh, the well, I think it lasts as long as three espressos. 
right. don't think it, it, the, the caffeine content's the same as an espresso. Right, it's just how you're digesting it then, or how you metabolize it. I've got a theory. It. I've got a theory about this, and okay. and I and we were I was about to um, spend some money with some brilliant people who were going to do some investigation for us prior to COVID, and hopefully in the next year or so we'll be able to do it again. I think that the half life on cold brew is double what it is with an espresso. And I think it's because it's brewed at, at a zero temperature or a 25 degree temperature. Right. So basically, if I'm going to drink an espresso at, say, 1 p.m. and still be able to sleep by 11, would no, that... This will kick your ass. Right. You will not be able to do it. It, it yeah. will. It, it, it just does not. It just keeps lasting. But it doesn't give you that spike. Mm. It just sort of just comes up oh, and then nice. just... Just like microdose the caffeine. Exactly, right. exactly. Right, so, you know, does do, does certain food and certain caffeine and certain uh, different things affect you? 100%. Mm. And your body type is, you know, you and I have a similar body type, right? So, you know, if, if like my metabolism, you know, started three weeks ago, mm. right? You know, it takes forever for anything to go through me. But the, the benefit that I've got is that if I drink, you know, I drink three or four double espressos to start off the day and then, you know, in the afternoon I'll drink a couple of, you know, longer coffees. Like yesterday I didn't have any coffee at all. Mm. And did it affect me? No. You know, you drink coffee usually every day? Usually every day. Okay. You know. And but one day you didn't drink it and you were fine? It doesn't affect me. Okay. But, but you know, like uh, my wife, I don't even talk to her until she's had two coffees. I, I right. understand her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I say it when I arrive at work. I say, you know, don't talk to me until I've had a couple of espressos. It's not necessarily that I need the espresso. It's actually that I want to have the time to actually arrive at work. Right. Get myself checked in, do my stuff, do everything, and then I want to deal with the day. It's a bit of placebo then, more or less. Huh? Yeah, don't tell anybody. All right. <laughs> so we so I went I went from, you know, running, you know, roasting every day. Now I'm now I'm a CEO of a company with sixty people in it. Right. It's a different way that you have to deal with life. Right, right, right. Um It's definitely not placebo. I mean I've had decaf coffee and I can tell the difference. And I you know, but I've been drinking coffee a lot, and I, you know what? Actually, this is the perfect uh, time to to ask you what, like, on the health aspects of coffee, because I personally have experienced nothing but uh, positive health aspects from coffee. Even when I, what my some people might consider to be excessive consumption of coffee, which is two or three double espressos. I mean, that's high by every standard. For me, I get energy, I get alertness, I work out when I drink coffee, I I slack on gym when I don't. I typically can get like a palpitating heart or, you know, if I'm drinking a lot of whiskey or whatever it is, um, coffee, not so much. I mean, after you get used to it. So I have only experienced positive outcomes and I've thankfully also did like a blood test recently knowing that I drink a lot of coffee and, and it turns out everything looks good. So I know this is just one, you know, anecdotal evidence, but what are the misconceptions about uh, coffee when it comes to the good and the bad, right? So are there benefits that are over-exaggerated or untrue? Similarly, are there any um, unbacked uh, kind of issues with coffee that, that are actually not true, but there just might be like a conjecture or, um, you know, the problem with a lot of these kind of epidemiolog epidemiology studies is that they, they look at samples of people, they correlate them with like cancer and death and other, other things. And you start to create um, causation when it's just a correlation. So a lot of the people who might drink a lot of coffee and have issues might have a bad health or lifestyle otherwise. And so you associate it with coffee, which is a very common mistake. But from your experience, and I know that, you know, are there any objective or close to objective um, uh, insights that we can draw out of uh, how coffee can improve your health or affect it positively versus negatively? Um, well, I mean, one of the first things that is interesting that a lot of people don't know about is that coffee is not a stimulant, right? So people think that you, they think it's the same as cocaine, right? So cocaine is a stimulant, right? So coffee is not a stimulant. What it is, is it's like, um, the, the easiest way to describe it is that you have receptors in your brain that accept uh, certain levels of other chemicals. So in the case of coffee, what you've got is a, is a receptor which is uh, wanting to receive a, uh, a signal to tell you to go to sleep. Uh, 
And what caffeine does is it blocks that receptor. It's like a, uh, a cover, a condom going over the top of the receptor. Mm-hmm. And the strength of that condom over the receptor is going to delay when you go to sleep. Right. Right? So unlike a stimulant like an amphetamine or you know cocaine or whatever – that actually stimulates, that actually adds more serotonin to your dopamine receptors. Coffee doesn't do that. Interesting. Right? So, same, so same feeling more or less, but different things going on. Exactly. Right. So this is why I talk about the half-life of a cold brew, right? So I will not drink cold brew in excess after 4 o'clock because I know I'm going to be awake till 2 o'clock in the morning. But, right. but uh, an espresso, for example, doesn't do that to me, which is why I want to get the study done to find out whether or not yeah. it's actually the way that you brew it, which is changing the chemical structure, which makes the condom stronger. Um, like a double condom. A double condom, yeah. <laughs> right. Heaven forbid we ever have to go back to that level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Interesting. I mean, uh, but, but so sorry, you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that um, the antioxidant effect. Right, so I'm not I, I, I'm not sure if you're you know hugely into a- antioxidants. I think it's sort of something that's disappeared over the last few years. But when you drink a any product, if you buy, heaven forbid, um, kale from the supermarket, <laughs> you know kale is um, cow lettuce. Um, Antioxidants exist in fruit and vegetables and meat and everything that is naturally processed. Mm -hmm. If you buy a processed coffee, it doesn't have any antioxidants at all. A processed coffee? Yeah, so Nespresso. Mm -hmm. Any instant coffee doesn't do it. Yeah. So if you are... um, if you're thinking that you're going to get your your you know some good benefit from drinking um, something that comes pre ground, um, uh, add hot water and it's instant processed, no, nah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, there's some some people who are wonderful customers of ours um, who have been um, who have way better scientific knowledge about um, the benefits health benefits from coffee. Uh, Keith Littlewood, who's based in Dubai. Um, I think it's keithlittlewood.com. Um, he's worth looking up. He understands a lot more than I do about it. And the conversations that I've had with him are about how positive that the caffeine molecule can do to your heart, you know, parts of your heart and, and other bits and pieces. To be honest, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I like to, I like to have a drink. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I think that, that everything that we do has to be in moderation. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you, you eat too much red meat, if you eat, you know, everything probably apart from eating too many vegetables, um, I think that we could, we could be affected by it. But so too much vegetables can be bad? Well, I don't know. I don't just, know. I've just never, take I'm, a bigger I, dump in the morning, but other than well, that. Yeah, I, I think too much rice yeah, affects me. Fair. fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or quinoa. I'm yeah. pretty much over quinoa. And kale. I mean, if you're going to be doing a keto diet, I think quinoa is the best choice you have for like a base to food that also has protein and low carbs, relatively speaking, to rice. So what do you do like when you're on a keto diet? Keto, I'm, I'm, I'm easy. I just eat meat. Like, I, like okay. when I'm like, so there's, and, but there's good, some, some good meats. Um, Carney Store here now has some amazing, amazing meat here. Yeah. Um, you know, grass fed. I'm not a corn fed boy. Right. Same. Uh, the only corn I have is in my barley. Bed. Right. Yeah. I actually, uh, so you've met my dog earlier and, and maybe next time you bring your dog and we have a play date, but I, you know, I've gotten into this carnivore diet for a while. I stopped it now and I need to get back into it because it was the best thing that I've done to myself. Right. But are you just shocking your system? Are you, have you, did you do it for an extended period? So I did it for a month, one month only, but like, um, I actually wasn't entirely carnivore. So I still had like whiskey at night or coffee yeah, in the morning. That, that's going to throw you off though. So that's not going to put you into keto. Yeah, you're right. But here's what I did. So naturally I stopped eating, um, like, so I would start eating at 2 p.m. Um, steak, Wagyu steak, which I get from this amazing butcher. But Wagyu is not good for you. Doesn't it, 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 the fat in Wagyu is just awful. 
Yeah. Right. You need to have an omega three fat, so you need to eat a grass fed. Yeah. Beef. So I get that. So I got the Australian grass fed beef, right? So mm. this is the, yeah, it's Australian. Uh, it's not from New Zealand. <laughs> I actually don't think these guys have it. So I get it from a place called Meat Avenue, which is a great um, butcher um, compared to the others in Dubai. But um, but I also mix up salmon and chicken, and so it's not just meat. But then what happens is that I start eating at uh, say I get I get pretty hungry by like one or two p.m. Especially if I got a workout in, have some steak, dog eats with me some steak so i think he's like the most privileged dog in dubai or even in the world by 6 6 7 p.m i'm hungry again grab a glass of whiskey eat another meaty uh chicken salmon fish or steak so i'm only eating six hours so intermittent fasting is happening by default only because i'm not even hungry before 2 p.m or even after my last meal at 8 p.m uh lost weight high energy i did that blood test i told you about um so testosterone was also high um then I started looking into the health uh, aspects. So uh, on the onset, it sounded like it's a crazy thing to just eat meat. And then I looked it up. It turns out there are a lot of misconceptions health-wise about things like the LDL and HDL cholesterol and how, um, you know, there's the VLDL, which is basically the, the triglycerides. If these guys are, if, the, if your triglyceride is high, then you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. But if your triglyceride is low and your LDL and HDL are both high, in terms of cholesterol, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in danger. Yeah, but this is the this is the thing that's a misconception with a huge amount of people about you know what we do is you know like so like I totally agree with you. the 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 problem with if you have any alcohol is that the, the ethanol needs to be burned off before your body's going to burn anything else. So it affects right? your metabolism. So it's metabolism, right? right? So if you have a slow metabolism, if you add alcohol in there, yeah, that's going to cause you a problem. Right. True. So, you know, what you're doing is exactly right, right? So, you know, you go out and you exercise. So you just know that you have to exercise longer. Yeah, that's right. All, that's all it that that, that, requires. That, that's it, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do look, so New Zealanders and Australians are, you know, we're, we're brothers in arms, but, you know, New Zealand actually has more grass, better grass, and the, the meat that we grow in New Zealand is better, right? There's no question, right? Agreed. Yeah. Um, the thing that I don't like is about any meat that's fed with a uh, substitute that's not natural, right? So a corn substitute or another grain or something like that. So the 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 reason is, and I've only just learned this in the last few months, is that the fat that's produced in something like a wagyu or a you know a number of these um, highly manufactured animals is not the good fat, mm. right? So an omega three fat. Like what you get in fish or salmon, basically. Yes, yes, but you also have to be careful because a lot of the stuff is farmed now and then they're feeding, they're actually supplementary feeding salmon mm. and those supplements are not producing the the, the oh, right wow. omegas. Right, right? Right, right. So if you're getting omega-3 rather than omega-6, then that, that, it's going to be a good thing. Um, I'll, I'm going to hook you up with some beef that is the world's best okay, beef. Let's do it's it. grown, <laughs> grown, the cows just about surf because they watch the surfers surfing and the salt blows across so they're nice and salty. And, nice, you know, yeah. nice, nice. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, I think that like if you just go into straight just eating massive amounts of meat, it's not a good thing, right? right? You have to listen to your body, sure. right? Your body is, it, like so I know that, you know, like I love to drink really good coffee. Like I, I hope my wife's not watching because <laughs> this morning we were, I'm like a plumber that's, that sinks leaking. Uh, I keep forgetting to bring coffee home and I've been off for this last week and, and yeah. I got up this morning and, and there was two shots of coffee in the grinder and I and I knew that she was going to get up after me and I thought, oh, I'm just going to have another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she managed to do it and then she was like, well, we've run out of coffee. Oh, yeah, we did. Um, but, you know, if you're, you know, you, you'd like to eat and drink things that give you pleasure. And and that's fine. But we, but if you listen to your body, you know when you've had yeah. too much. Yeah, right? yeah, you know when you have too much of everything. I mean, listening, this is the whole thing about listening to your body, right? It's like placebo. Um, a lot of times you could eat something and in your head you're thinking, oh, I just, I went vegan or I went carnivore, the total opposite, and I feel better and so on. A lot of times it's like this kind of uh, expectation you have from what you should feel because of what you've been told you should feel about eating this or going on a certain diet. Like there's this thing called also nocebo, which I came to discover, which is... Um, if I tell you you're going to have uh, medicine or food um, 
and it's going to have these side effects and then I give you something that's fake Mm-hmm. you will actually develop the side effects. It's like the opposite of placebo. So like with placebo, you might think you get better because I tell you this medicine is going to help you uh, treat your disease. No, <sighs> nocebo is a real thing where if I tell you this thing is going to make you sick, you will go sick. How many times have I felt like I've had COVID in the last year? Yeah, for example. Right. Only just because I, you know it's there, right? You know, like we, the brain is the most powerful thing that we have. It's fascinating. It, it, it is fascinating, and you know, one of the things that um, that I've I've experienced in the last. Um, so I turned fifty last year. I'm not acknowledging it. I'm going to have my fiftieth birthday when we can actually have a birthday. Okay. Um, <laughs> Happy birthday. But, yeah. but but one of the things that I experienced over the last three or four years is that I started to get a bit older, and I was overweight. Um, I was definitely drinking too much. You know, I was definitely doing all those things because I had a business that I had to run and, you know, I had all these excuses. But one of the things that I discovered is that um, uh, CBDs were something that made a huge difference to my life. And, you know, like I had a bad back. And, um, you know, I, I managed to get um, CBDs and started taking those. And the difference was taking pharmaceuticals to control pain to actually having mobility and having, you know, my life back and being able to do things and being actually able to exercise because I wasn't in pain and I was able to do. Like I wasn't at the point where I'm taking, you know, like like Opioids stopping or, and no, yeah. I wasn't like that. I was just like, you know, oh well, you know, I'm just it's easier just to have a drink to make, you know, yeah. it not feel bad anymore. So you know, we we as society are going to come through this whole lockdown and we're going to come through something else in the next few years that are going to mean that people are going to start to realize that they have to listen to their bodies yeah yeah Yeah. i hear you um i think you already start to see uh a lot of this uh replacement of classic medicine for physical pain like back pain or even mental issues in countries like the u.s where you can get like the equivalent of what acid or lsd is or mushrooms um you know, you can get treated by your psychiatrist who will actually give you like microdosed acid or LSD or psilocybin or even ayahuasca. Not exactly yet a clinical um, solution in the US, but um, a lot of people seem to, you know, when we talk about listening to your body, uh, plant medicine, especially that organic kind of untouched on, uh, you know, it's not played with, um, seems to have like a very profound impact um, uh, probably more on people who have issues, uh, mental issues or child abuse or whatever it is, but also physical. Like I, I actually know the guy, we, we we met my partner earlier, Georgia. We were in New York and uh, <clears throat> we were to the, we went to this co-working space called The Assemblage, lovely place. Um, the founder of The Assemblage in New York had uh, cancer, terminal cancer, uh, stage cancer, and he was like told that he needs to get his affairs in order, um, has a couple of months to live. That goes into Peru. Um, that was like five years ago, and does ayahuasca. And uh, the doctors couldn't believe it. It's actually part of the founding story of this assemblage co-working space in New York. Is that this uh, man ended up uh, not only treating this terminal stage cancer through ayahuasca, um, but then goes on to start this business, which today is one of the best co-working spaces in New York. So. Um, this connection between what you could consume and your body and what you might be going through physically or mentally, back pain, maybe depression or anxiety or whatever it is, as an alternative to everything else, all these fucking pills that you can get, opioids is one of them, but then, you, the, the you know, everything, it's just the pharma industry, I think, is going to change completely. Yeah, so the, the food industry yeah, is going to change. The, 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 the pharma society that we live in is just so bad. You know, like... like you know what makes you feel better, mm. right? So having a drink, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That makes you feel better for a minute period of time. But tomorrow it doesn't feel make you feel any better, right? Right. So there are so many things out there that make you feel better, right? right? And, you know, the stories that you're talking about, I have hundreds of friends who will tell you that they have suddenly realize that you know wheat makes them feel bad right? right well okay you know there's a lot of things that are trendy and there's a lot of things that are um 
cool for now. A lot of things that make, you know, that, you know, I'm intolerant to this or intolerant to that. Okay, that's good. But listen to your body. Like, listen to what's actually going on and maybe get some exposure to some other stuff that is 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 actually better for you. Um, there is... Uh, a lot of changes that are happening. Um, my um, my boys are living in Canada right now. Um, How old? Uh, twenty one and twenty three, mm-hmm. um, and you know they are legally are now allowed to try things that we're not allowed to try here. And it's very mm-hmm. interesting because um, my twenty one year old is sending me messages going, Dad you know, really you need to try some Girl Scout cookies because they are fantastic. <laughs> and I'm just going, yeah, okay, maybe. It's a good indica. Yeah, well, it's, you know, <laughs> it's it, it sort of, you know, th- there are, you know, there are, there is a lot of things that w- have been in our society right. for thousands of years that prohibition has meant that we can't enjoy them over the last 50 years. And I actually mean enjoy because I've also got... Um, my in-laws, who are now literally going, I am 60 years old, I've never done anything but apart from have a couple of beers, and now society says that I can smoke a joint, and is there anything wrong with that? And I'm going, well, you know what, okay, so there's all these good things that you can do for your body, but are you allowed to relax? Yeah. Are we actually allowed as people just to go, ah, whatever? Yeah, I mean, and it's also so much better. We we typically do this with a glass of whiskey or a glass of wine. Like, oh, I had a hard day, a tough day at work. Let me just like kind of, truthfully, health wise, mood wise, on every level, um, this shit is really the worst thing that you could do to yourself, like to your body and also to your mood. You get aggressive, you get violent, you get moody, versus like you can just get bubbly and giggly and 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 uh, you know, even with sex. Like, I mean, there's no the only thing that's bad about smoking a joint or, or doing some. I mean, cocaine and heroin and, and you know, when we start to go into synthetics and so on, probably should have some limits. Like, I think maybe if you give people who are depressed like access to any drug they could use maybe they could destroy themselves but with some things i think maybe they could be with the right kind of uh, guidance and hand holding um probably beneficial and uh, you already see examples of that in the u.s where people who were hooked on heroin and opioids have managed to get off that and not kill themselves because they started smoking uh, legal marijuana in some states right that's that's one of the things that you, you well yeah but you know i i also think that that the, the the environment that you're in is going to dedicate, you know, or, or predicate what you actually end up wanting to do, right? So if you're in a if you're in a position where you are a coffee farmer in Peru, where your likelihood of starving for three months is, you know, pretty high, and somebody turns up with something that's going to make the pain go away, you're going right. to do it, right? Yeah. And that could be an opioid, and they they might be trying to take advantage of you. Yeah, and and that's happening in every country around the world. Yeah, you know, and that, and that's the problem, right? So you and I have the luxury that you know that we can choose to drink a fine bourbon. Yeah, you know, and 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 we have that luxury. So I think that there's a lot of lot of case, and, and adding a whole bunch of you know you know, uh, availability of something is not necessarily the right thing. Not at all. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. That, so I've also had, I had three shoulder surgeries. Um, I've also had uh, some issues with my back six years ago. And I actually did take opioids as a medicine uh, for to, to kind of like numb the pain for the shoulder surgeries and all that. Um, and I can safely tell you, somebody who's also doubled around with everything from weed to acid and mushrooms and everything in between, that I can see how addictive it can get. Um, like, taking those pills which are basically heroin in a pill um fortunately we live in a city which controls the stuff to a point that i have not seen for example in san francisco which is where i also lived where doctors will prescribe you um oxytocin or oxycontin whatever like or or, uh, vicodin or whatever it is that you the brand is on demand you might as well just go in and ask them for it like chewing gum and yeah. it's actually as expensive as a chewing gum right so you go into san francisco and, and you go through this dichotomy because you're walking down the streets in san francisco where you see uber and all these tech companies and all this innovation and all this like kind of wealth and the very expensive rent and you know that's san francisco silicon valley 
in the same exact block, we're talking about like the most, the highest number of uh, homeless people I've ever seen hooked on drugs, hooked on exactly those kind of drugs we're talking about here, the pharmaceutical opioids. Um, and this creates this weird irony, right? You're in San Francisco, and yet you see all these like people hooked on these drugs. But have you ever seen anywhere where opioids have been beneficial? No, not at all. I mean, I'm just glad that this in the city, they have a very tight control on it. Like you need to really, like they will only prescribe it to you after surgery and that's it. You have to like, you know. But like, so I, I have had opioids when, you know, in certain situations and in, in every time it's been a negative experience for me. It's yeah. not it's not something that I enjoy. Yeah. And you know, I, I just I just wonder like so I, I learned something the other day that um, uh, one of the things when you when you travel to uh, coffee origins and when you, you do it, um, uh, when you when you're travelling around uh, developing countries is that uh, you you have a bad stomach pretty bad oh, so yeah. um you know i've i've taken um uh i've taken emodium for years as a placebo when i'm traveling emodium is what exactly emodium it just stops you shitting okay right yeah. and i found out three days ago that emodium is actually a derivative of um opium that they modify the molecule to take out all the other fun receptors and it just makes you block up. Oh, wow. Right? So I'm going, okay, so these people who are addicted to heroin or morphine or whatever, they, <laughs> they are constantly blocked up. I mean, I mean, what a miserable experience. Right. And for me, uh, you know, I'm lucky. It's not something that I, that I would enjoy. But there is... There are so many other things that you could do. Look, you know, um, THC is a way better mood enhancer than alcohol. Sure. Right? Um, you know, there's other things in the psychedelic world that, that should be way, way, way better for you to adjust what you're doing. But it's not recreational. This is... This is Painful stuff. Pain, maybe, opioids are the way to go. But no, I mean, like these are not necessarily pleasant experiences, but are good for you. Like, uh, so we're so used to being in a society where we we want to take something and it immediately fixes. Right. But but that's not what life is about, right? right. Life is about going through experiences that you have to adjust, and it's, there's no immediate correction. Yeah. Right. But but pharmaceutical companies are designed to give us an immediate fix. Right. Does it fix the problem? No. Yeah, it just numbs it. No, it just stops the um, the the effect that we're getting right now. Right. Right? 100%. Right? So we could sit here and drink two bottles of bourbon and regardless of what we're talking about, we wouldn't remember it. Right. right? Whereas, for example, like the, 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 the more purgy types or the plant medicine where you have to go through a really confrontational experience with your childhood or even like throw up or have diarrhea and it's not pleasant by any definition. Um psychedelic as it might be and definitely they are they, they are they are psychedelic and they're very um, intense in that sense but they may not seem pleasant on the onset it's not like taking uh, a pill of an opioid or a line of co or heroin or coke or whatever it might be or your poison um, but they can be um, re regenerative right so they they they, f they transform you as a person in fact I, I'm, I'm excited to get a guest uh, in a couple of weeks who, who's uh, you don't often typically get Arabic uh, speakers or people who grew up in the Middle East who have also dabbled around with things like ayahuasca or DMT or there's like a, like a world of spectrum of, of things between those two um, or around them. Um, but it turns out like these things can be transformational and they're not uncomfortable for you to go through. Like nobody wants to sit there and vomit in a bucket or take a shit in front of everybody and shit their pants. But but, th but that's not the, that's not the po point of a lot of these experiences, right? They're so not. It's just a side, it's a byproduct of it. So it, it, it's it's very interesting in the Middle East that you look at um, the plants that grow in in this desert that we live in. Uh, the, they are psychoactive, right? Right. So um, it's maybe that you know in the last two hundred years. I mean, how old is the UAE? We're turning fifty next 30, year. 40, yeah, fifty, I guess. Yeah. Fifty next year. Yeah. Right. So fifty years the UAE. 
wonderful country, developed more than we can possibly imagine. But the peninsula has been growing plants for however many thousands of years that um, actually are, you know, contain substances that you know, will, will alter your state. So you know, if we're looking for the last 50 years, we're doing really well. Right. If we're looking for the last thousand years, oh, we've got a lot of catching up. I mean, really? you know, you and I are a dot on the on the time scale. True. true right. True, and true. so so maybe that the time scale that we're living in, we haven't had the the teachers or the 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 the, the ability because of prohibition to be able to understand what things around us can deliver right but if fortunately if it's anything like the pro- alcohol prohibition that happened in was it 20s or 30s in the u.s it's only a matter of time before you know people eventually act out and, and you know so i mean my personal experience of, of being able to have um cbds and what it does just you know for me and hundreds of people that i know yeah just as a just a simple way of just making your body work yeah. i've got i've got friends in new zealand who have been working a lot more with it and there's a um there's a system in your body called the endocannabinoid system that requires i mean we have these systems in our body and in 1930 the world prohib- prohibited us from taking a updose of these cbds CBDs by uh, the endocannabinoid system. Yeah, I mean, I understand with, with when it comes to marijuana, you have the THC, which is the more like psychoactive ingredient, and then you have CBD that will not get you high, but will mm-hmm. treat you in many ways, or even make you get you relaxed or so on. When I was in London uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there were stores selling CBD. Like you would look at the bud, the marijuana bud, and you're like, "Oh, this is like I'm gonna smoke weed right now," and like you smoke it and you don't get high, but you get relaxed. It's like smoke. It's like the equivalent of drinking chamomile, maybe I would say. Or, um, but but you sleep well. Uh, I know that I don't have any epilepsy, thank God, or any other kind of chronic issues. But I've seen um, videos of like parents even giving some of their pets, not even their children, who have like issues, a little bit of drop of CBD, and like my God, what a miracle! Well, the, the challenge that we have today is the what? What are you taking? Because sure. prohibition is causing people not to be able to deliver, you know, what what the good things are. Right. Um, I am not an expert in this, and I and I I, I have um, I have very limited experience because one of the the things about living in this region is mm. that we're not allowed to uh, experience any of these things. So, um, but what I do know is that you have a uh, cannabinoid system in your body. Right. And that is natural. It's a little bit like I was talking about water before, and the the water has some things that make coffee taste bad, right. but they're actually part of the brain um, uh, uptake. And so, um, what's what people are starting to discover today is that we need these cannabinoids. Sure. Now they're not things that make you high. They are just basically things that occur in right. your body and we have restricted the ability to uptake those. Now, the, one of the interesting things that people don't know is if you eat marijuana, it doesn't make you high, right? So you actually you have to smoke ha- it. You have to burn it. You actually right. have to change the temperature of it. So so with hash brownies and all that stuff? Like, well, yeah, they've yeah. been heated. So right, fair enough. You know, they've been cooked and the chem- yeah. chemistry has changed. But if you just take the plant and you just yeah. eat it, doesn't make you high. So the cannabinoids is what's going on. I see yeah. what you're saying, right? Yeah. DMT is this other thing which uh, turns out when you're dreaming or when you're a child. Was it? If I'm not mistaken, I think if your uh, kids or babies have a lot of the DMT production in their brain, when you're dreaming, you're definitely producing DMT, and when you're dying, a lot of DMT is produced. So this is one drug that has been transformational for people who have tried it. They get to interact with all these uh, allegedly extraterrestrial, very loving, very compassionate beings that you don't even experience when you're in real life, obviously, because we're humans and animals and all that. But then people who have smoked DMT go to this um, place where they experience an interaction with themselves or something else, but some entity that is uh, full of love and compassion, but it's obviously outside of the reality. But then DMT, which is what you're smoking, is also what your brain is producing when you're dreaming, when you're when you're a baby, and definitely when you're dying. So there's 
this is what fascinates me. Like this is a natural chemical compound that your body is going to produce at some in some circumstance, whether you're sleeping or whether you're dying, for example. And then you get to actually have access to it from plants like ayahuasca and also smoking it. And you finish that trip um, and and your perspective on life has changed. Your ego has changed. Um, I find this to be mind blowing, you know, and I find like it's where we're years behind where we should be when it comes to that, because we know we have access to it, but we just prevent people from getting access to it. But but also those compounds are available in just about every plant that you interact with them on a daily basis. Like DMT? Yeah. It's in every plant. It's everything. It's in it's in in very minute places everywhere that we are. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I think that there are. So what I understand is that the the cultures and the you know around the world who have had thousands of years of understanding this stuff, um, they they know how to extract it and it's used to concentrate it and then give it to people at the right time. Right. Right. So. You know, we're in a, uh, you know, we can order anything in the UAE. I used to joke, you know, 10 years ago about being able to order McDonald's, right? So you and I take that for granted. But in right. New Zealand, right, ordering McDonald's was like, really? Yeah. You know, you can't order McDonald's. Yeah. You know, but, but we, we're an instant demand society, right? right? So now we want, we want our psychedelics on demand, you know, yeah. we want to we want to have it now. Yeah, but but that, that that's not that's not what thousands of years ago people dealt with, right? Yeah. They were they were delivered through you know plant based medicine, and you know there were there were people who were experienced in this, and they made sure that from a young age that people were given the right compounds, and probably they were given just as much as they were given psychedelics they were given vitamin c and they're given vitamin b and vitamin yeah. d they were given they were they were balanced yeah. right because they understood what was required today we live in um you know tiny little bubbles where we have to control everything because we're not treating our bodies correctly we're not doing everything so we now have to change everything True. i mean i've been i've been taking 10,000 milligrams of vitamin D for the last year because, yeah. you know, like I love to get out in the sun. I love to... Just, it's not enough, apparently. Well, it's not enough, yeah. apparently. So, you know, like, like all these things that we're doing, you know, that we're, we've yeah. created it, you know, so maybe maybe all these experiences... Like, I, I know some very, very clever people from Silicon Valley... I know some very, very clever people who are going down and doing IR experiences down in Peru, Peru and you know, and 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 they're enjoying those experiences because you should. You're allowed to enjoy an experience, right? Um, but and improve your life. It's not just. I don't think it's as recreational as it is transformational. I mean, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it at some level, but I think it's like if you want to have fun, there are drugs to have fun. If you want to figure something out in your life i think there are drugs for that when, I, I, no? you know I, I i think some people push it yeah okay right you know like i um i think that people i think that you know just because you you can afford a plane ticket down to peru and you can go and do an ayahuasca experience that you should go and do it i think that you you know i i, I honestly think that sometimes you need to just go really yeah. Are you, you know, do you do you need to be the next best person because you've done an ayahuasca experience? Right. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that's a good idea or maybe you could just meditate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could get so there's holotropic breathing and all those kind of breathwork exercises that you could do which I haven't managed to get there. I do have some interesting breathwork exercises. But some of them are meant to actually um, get you to activate DMT somehow. Maybe not as much as ayahuasca would or even smoking it outright. But turns out, you know, you could, in theory, um, release DMT through breath work and through very deep meditation and, and, and reap the benefits of that experience. But do we have to go as deep as DMT? Maybe not, I guess. I lo I, I'm a diver. Right. I've been diving since I was eight years old. And uh, for the last year, I haven't gone away for a month's worth of diving. And the diving that I've been doing, I, ha I told you before that I have a place in the Gilly Islands. Right. And 
um, that was my that was my DMT holiday under the water. Under the water, you know, doing 50, 60 hours in a month, just just being in nothing. Yeah. You know? um, I suffer from tinnitus. Um, What's that? It's uh, ringing in your ears. Okay. It just constantly um, rings in my ears. And for some reason, when I dive, it disappears. Mm. And, um, you know, like just going down and, and I have young boys and as a older father, I want to compete with them. So, you know, my, my young boys are, you know, go deeper, go longer and everything. And so now I'm a, a technical diver, so I go quite deep at, you know, and using different gases to go down to different levels. And I've discovered that reducing the amount of oxygen that I have reduces my tinnitus and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I have no idea if there's any scientific aspect to it. But also the fact that you focus your brain on one thing mm. that is not about what is happening in today's life. Right. You know, for me to have that decompression, which is ironic when it comes to diving, but have that decompression <laughs> for a month of actually having a place where I just go and, and do nothing but focus on that because I'm doing something that is physically very difficult and also um, if I do it wrong, I die. Right. right, so I'm not doing recreational diving. I'm doing very deep diving. Survival diving. Well, no, it's just that we go down to levels where we can't come up. Yeah, right? you're not just hanging out there, basically. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no. And and I love the whole aspect of looking at fish and doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But the actual mental aspect of actually totally focusing on doing that that is is a release, right? Doesn't require me to go to Peru to the jungle and do ayahuasca and throw up and shit. Fair enough. But but equally, what we have to do is is everything that you can do in your life. You, I think that you can actually find aspects of it. Agreed. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, it's it's that would be the ideal evolutionary state if you can activate that heightened state of mind and awareness and the consciousness without any kind of help. Uh, and and I think, uh, as you said, the different people have different uh, ways of getting there. Um, Last time I had a guest on, we were talking about the flow state, which is like if mm. you do anything in a mm -hmm. high challenge and you're good at it, you're oh just you're there, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. Think yes, about yes. like a musician who's just making music and he's wow. immersed, or he or she rather, or anybody else, like or even somebody who's like coding or like we're doing an Excel model, but like they're just like they know exactly what they're doing. They know all the shortcuts. I love that situation. I, I I get into that situation a lot, and I I. When you can hit that flow state, oh, yeah, it's amazing. God, you lose track of time. But but you also, I've had it when I've been in selling, like right. I've actually been in a situation where I've been at a trade show. You know, when I was younger, where you were just nothing could touch you for two days, yeah. three days. You just just everybody that you interacted with just wanted to be part of your your world, and you could sell. Yeah, you know those things are fantastic. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Matt, I don't know how long has it been. Uh, we we got we were almost close to two hours. I, I don't want to take up more of your time, but I have to say this has been absolutely fantastic. I'd love to have you again on the show. I also would love for you to bring uh, your dog, and also for us to meet your your wife. Hopefully, we get to do this again. Um, thank you so much for coming. Do you have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners, our viewers that we haven't covered, or we can? Just been an absolute pleasure. It's been, it, likewise, and I thank you so much for coming. Thank you again for this delicious bourbon. Um, I'm I'm a single malt drinker, but I might be switching to this because this is delicious Buffalo Trace. Thank you so much for this. And um, I actually need to go to Royal Coffee tomorrow to stock up again, so I'll probably see you there. Um, and that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you very much. <laughs>